<laughs> Somehow it's complicated to sit down. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Ramesh, and I'm here to talk with you about something that humanity kind of discovered in 1729, but you deal with it every day. It influences your, your rhythm of how you wake and how you sleep, and all of these elements uh, percolate into the being that you are, how effective you are, how uh, redundant some things become. And you know this has the circadian rhythm. If you've ever been on a transatlantic flight, um, I'm going to use an example from my life. Years ago, I lived in Barcelona. It wasn't an intentional thing. Um, I, I fell for a girl. We ended up going to Cuba together four days into a two week trip. We broke up. It turned into the best uh, vacation ever. We were together for uh, those two weeks and just processing and growing. And, and when I got back to the airport in Cuba, um, I had missed my flight by a week. Long story short, I ended up living in Europe for over a year and a half, and it was a wonderful exploration and discovery process, but I was leveled when I arrived in Munich. I, I hadn't slept well. I had had some digestive stuff from some street ice cream. I'll leave it back to you to paint that picture, but I, it took me probably like a week to get back to, okay, this is when the sun comes up. I wake up now. This is when the sun goes down. This is when I go to bed. And I didn't know that there were things that I could do to help influence that. But as I've studied this over the years, it's made me realize that, wow, there's actually a lot happening here and, and there's a lot more that I can work with. And I'll give you the, the, the root of the word circadian. They're, they're both Latin. Uh, if we think of uh, carpe diem, seize the day, diem is day. So circadian, dia, and then circa is around. So around the cycle of the day, we're talking about this, this daily cycle, which we generalize to be 24 hours. But this internal rhythmic clock, it, this biological clock is actually 24 hours and 11 minutes. So if you think about it, that's where sometimes every couple of years we get a leap year. We have to account for that uh, cycle because we as humans, we like symmetry. We like some sort of consistency in our, in our rhythms. And so nobody's going to set a clock for 24 hours and 11 minutes. What we do is we just kind of create this great equalizer every now and then. Um, when Dimarin discovered the biological clock, it was rooted in something called the hypothalamus. Hypo means below, and the thalamus is a, a relay station in the center of our brain. Any sort of sensory information that comes into the body tends to hit the thalamus, and then that's kind of where uh, it's almost like the train switching station is. Now this signal goes here. This is where it's going to find information. This is, you know, and so the hypothalamus is really governing a lot of our internal rhythms. It governs our body temperature. It governs our hormones. Um, the hypothalamus actually influences the pituitary gland, which is the master gland of the body. And so, we have this daily rhythm and you do it effortlessly. Your eyes recognize as the sun starts to arise and it switches the production of melatonin, which is the sleep hormone, into serotonin, which is the hormone of alertness and awake. And so over, you know, um, how long? This biological clock was really forged over a few million years. Our ancestors would, um, you know, need to be able to 
to relate to the environment around them. And so essentially that's in training. We're in training the, these rhythms of internal and external clock. And we don't think about it, but depending on the time of day you do something, you can actually have a profound influence on, let's say, your effectiveness versus your ineffectiveness. And for the majority of us, we whether we've really sat with it and journaled it out and, and tracked our days or not, you probably recognize that after lunch, noon, one o'clock, wherever you live, there's something that happens in the body. And there's this kind of trough. All of a sudden, like our energy from the morning is we kind of reached our apex and we start to go down. But what does that actually look and feel like? Well, the peak that we're sort of coming down from is our peak of a uh, analytic capability. We have the ability to be very um, task oriented. We're very um, linear, left brain kind of, right? The, the body has an ability to say, here are the five tasks that I'm going to sit down and do. I've got a lot of energy for them. My attention span is very clear. I've delineated exactly where and what needs to get done, and, and I'm running through those things. After we eat lunch, you know, for most people, it's between 12 and 1, right? We've got that 7 to 1 period where the, the body is really at its most analytic, capable, uh, optimal. And then we go into this trough. And, you know, interestingly enough, that trough can be almost as influential as if we were over the legal limit of drinking alcohol. Our, our cognitive abilities can decline up to 20%, which is a lot, you know, like for some people after lunch, them driving a car is risky. We don't talk about that. We don't talk that our, our relationship to our, our body and our rhythms are has profound has some of the substances that we can adjust or you know our lack of so that rhythm that period let's say uh, is from about one o'clock to five o'clock and then we start to come into a recovery so it looks like this i'm forgive me because i'm not mirroring let me try it your way we come up to our peak from, we start here at seven o'clock when we wake up and immediately, it's like low level stress in the body, but we're awake. And so that creates a release of cortisol and adrenaline. And just to wake up, we have an engagement with the world. And so we peak here at about 12, 30, one o'clock, and we go into a trough. All of a sudden our ability to be analytic declines. In that trough, is a great time to do rote things. Things like the laundry or emails or whatever you can do in a very small sort of, you know, not outcome dependent so much as like very uh, manageable, easy kind of things. And then as we start to recover, where we're actually coming up on is our um, insight ability. We have a bit more right brainness. Our body is designed at that place to um, be iterative. All of a sudden we can take different pieces of the puzzle and put them together in new combinations and say, oh, I never thought about it that way. I could, hmm, yeah, and work with that. You know, it's so important not to allow the mundane tasks to enter into that peak period of optimized capability and intention. But we do that because a lot of us are unaware of this cycle and this rhythm. You know, so many people I know will swallow down, let's say tiredness and just kind of push through. They'll get four to five hours of sleep a night. And there's a wonderful researcher. I think he's an Englishman, but he's based out of San Francisco and he's written a book called Sleep. His name is Matthew Walker. And Matthew Walker talks about how they've studied this. They've really gone in and figured out how the brain works, what the body is, is going to need in order to do that. And 
as an example, when I lived in Barcelona, in Europe, in my 20s, I, I worked at a, at a bar in a, in a plaza named after George Orwell, who had fought in the Civil War there, but they had called it Plaza Trippy. Long story short, every night at about 12, 31, 2 o'clock, we would have the garbage men come through. And they did this every night because in the center of town, it was such a tourist trade, you needed to have the, um, the place to be tiny, spick and span, clean, right? And so these tradesmen would come through and we would often, you know, like prop them up with beer because it was one, two in the morning and they were in the middle of their work day. Um, it's Barcelona, these guys drink frequently, but you know, they would just travel along the, the routes and pick up the garbage. That's kind of what is happening in sleep. When we give ourselves the period of rest, seven, eight hours, the majority of us need, you know, six is really kind of stretching it. The majority of us need eight hours of rest because what's happening is all of the byproducts of the daily process, the metabolic wastes, they accumulate in our tissues. And at midnight, when we're asleep, the garbage trucks kind of come through and they collect all of that waste and expunge it. They, they figure out a place where they can go and send it and recycle it and, and deal with it in a way that's helpful to us. When we don't get enough sleep, what happens is we become cognitively, we, we, we go into a decline. It's harder for us to muster the resources to generate that sort of, um, that recycling capacity. And that over time generates things like, uh, I was talking the other day about ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, is a byproduct of these plaques that build up in the nervous tissue. And these plaques, some suggestions say that it's actually a byproduct of inflammation. A lot of our, um, chronic diseases seem to be a byproduct of inflammation over time. So the body is no longer able to process and wring out and flush these metabolic waste because it's not getting the rest that it needs. It's not even getting the motion or the exercise to help like move the thing through the body. And we need to generate that for our lifetime. Uh, Otherwise, we reach a point in our middle ages where we start to also hit that peak and decline without the recovery. And sleep is such a key component to that, being able to get that recovery. Every 24 hour and 11 minute cycle, we're having that ability to reset the clock, reset the ability for the body to talk about and coerce itself into greater functionality. And sleep is a key component, but also really spending some time with your own rhythms and getting as much a good quality rest, yes, but also good quality nutrition, working with the cycle of your body to say, oh, this is the optimal time for me actually to be nourishing my body. Uh, the more quality nutrition I can get here, the more my body can really start to uh, till the soil of my being and knit the whole thing together. You know, we talk about this body has this matter of substance, and it is. But you have to recall, and this is pure science, it's not just some like woo-woo, wackadoos type stuff, but preceding the physical matter of your body is an energetic structure. We look at the body as an organism. The body is a physical organism, but what is an organism? An organism is a collection of systems. Okay, well, what makes up a system? We're talking about the endocrine system. That's the hormonal cascade of your body that ultimately helps you build up the tissues. Um, hormones are made out of molecules bound together in some sort of chemical relationship Systems are made out of organs that are built together out of chemical relationships bound through molecules. Well, what forms molecules is just atoms and atoms bind together. They kind of fist bump, they, they shake hands or they do like a Roman lock. 
those different types of bonds generate the different uh, structures of these, these interactions. So this is pretty easy to break apart. This is a lot harder. The way that these uh, metabolic byproducts of our breath inhale oxygen into the body, exhale carbon dioxide. That's the metabolic, metabolic byproduct of our metabolism. So if we're breathing up here into our chest and we're not getting enough fresh oxygen down here to the fullness of our body, we're having a harder time exchanging these tissues out. Over time, not getting enough sleep, not getting the right amount of nutrition, all of these things compound themselves. If you've ever uh, created a mutual fund for yourself and you understand compound interest, it's the same thing with your money that's happening in your body. So every night that you don't get a full seven, eight hours of sleep, you can't make that up. You can't catch it back into your body again. You can't say, I'll sleep five hours for a week. And then on the weekend, I'm going to get like 13 hours of sleep in one night. Your body certainly appreciates it. Um, some of the tissues are going to spend time metabolizing and working out some of the, the issues that they, they weren't able to. But there are some capacious, profound elements of the body that are just not going to get the same sort of quality uh, reset. And so I would suggest to you that it's worthwhile to spend a week journaling about when you're most uh, efficient, when you're working in a, in a way that works for you. Um, see if you can start to explore, okay, between the hours of seven and one, I'm most efficient at what's working for me to be the most uh, capable person and effective person in the world that I am. Notice between one o'clock and five o'clock, okay, this, these tasks are actually quite hard. I'm, I'm not doing well with A, B, C. And then in the evening, how does it work again when, okay, now I'm, I'm not really super analytic and I'm not getting a lot of linear stuff done, but am I more iterative? Do I have the capacity to generate for myself insights that I hadn't previously had? I know a lot of folks who practice uh, transcendental meditation love to do 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night. And I actually really dig that because they're, they're touching both left brain and right brain in that period. They're, they're able to generate for themselves like a bit of space where things make sense as well as enough of a perspective in both. You know, with also meditation, it's so valuable not to, I mean, look, if you can sit for three hours at one period of time and touch that place for that long, that consistently, brilliant, do it. But for the most of us, our attention span operates between, you know, like 52 minutes is kind of the peak of our ability to concentrate on one task for a prolonged period of time. Inevitably, we need breaks from that. You know, for some of us, it's like as low as 17 minutes um, and some anywhere in between those. You know, I was in the, the store the other day looking at a book. And I picked it up and I realized it wasn't something that I was interested in, but I'd been uh, listening to Masterclass a lot and James Patterson discussing books that I've never really read, but that he was talking about his writing process. And I thought, this is dope. Like, and then I picked up one of his books and I realized it wasn't actually even just a standard paperback, but it was three books in one. So many of us have lost the attention span and the capacity to prolong our attention for one book. We can't even do that. We've actually gotten into, uh, okay, I just actually want 100 pages of the story and that's enough for me. Are we so busy that we can't schedule enough time to enjoy and follow through reading one book? Have we gotten so busy and, and task oriented that we can't even commit to enough sleep for one evening? It's not a question for me to answer for you. It's just a question that I've been asking of myself. And, you know, it's tricky to reset 
this all and and practice the art of practicing. Um, what does it mean um, for me to become something more? And I personally have found looking into the circadian rhythm and developing a relationship with these tasks, um, especially in their, their blocks of time, you know, being able to say, okay, in the morning, like I wake up, I, I practice, I, I sit, I touch that place, the sort of ephemeral, and then come back from there with tasks orientated. Maybe I've set them up the night before, but I've evolved them in my meditation and developed like a perspective on, okay, great. Like I know that I need to produce that content. I know that I need to post it on YouTube. I know that I need to uh, open up more classes on Insight Timer. I need to schedule a, a whole uh, course for SkyTing come the end of uh, the summer. What is it that's going to involve in that? How are some of the techniques that I'm working on stretching the diaphragm going to play into all of these different courses? Oh, I gotta water the plants. Like, is that something that needs to be in my linear time or can I do that in the middle of the afternoon when I'm less cognitively alert? A little bit of curiosity goes a long way, don't you think? Um, so I want to give you just a couple of books that I think are valuable in, in exploring this practice um, and some of the information that I've gleaned information from. I want to give you a couple of tasks um, relative to concentrated effort in your work and then giving yourself a little bit of a kick of a reset and refresh. And then um, we'll probably just sit for a couple of minutes quietly because um, really that's the reset. Um, so... Sachin Panda is a researcher. He's from India, he's lived in Canada. I believe he's in America now. In his book, The Circadian Code, he's really kind of the preeminent researcher on this topic. So if you can find this book and look up um, some of the information, I, I thought it was fascinating. I mean, even just, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people aren't getting the quality of sleep that they would like. And if you haven't um, seen James Nestor's book, Breathe, uh, the art, uh, uh, the, what does he call it? The, the lost art of an uh, old science or the new science of an old art. That's what it is. Um, check it out. It's worth it. hundred percent. Like uh, there's so many things in there. There's so many of us who maybe had dental surgery that didn't need it. Um, Tracy Stanley is an incredible human being. Um, she is one of those people who worked as a uh, producer in film and television and pivoted, was like, this doesn't serve me anymore. She moved her entire world to focus on teaching healing techniques of ancient yoga practices. Yoga Nidra is uh, a wonderful tool for, you know, if you do miss that sleep, I practice this sometimes 20 to 30 minutes a day, and I feel like I get three times as much rest in comparison. So it's worthwhile. Um, the Ritual of Power. This gentleman is a, uh, I believe he's uh, like a priest or uh, a reverend or some such. And it's, uh, you know, exploring these ritualized practices are valuable. And I think a lot of us, we get so occupied in our day to day and uh, the rituals that we have are default mechanisms. Really so much of our really 95% of what we generate in the world is pre-programmed into us. We have this subconscious operating system. We absorb most of it in our data state in the first seven years of our life. So the people that we were around really just inputted into us a way of being. When we don't think about it, we don't engage with questioning any of it, we just default to those mechanisms. And a lot of this quality of rest, quality of food, quality of uh, awareness and curiosity itself and the relationship with the world around us generates 
change. You know, if we want to input like a new thought so that let's say I would like to be less reactive. If I would like to be less reactive, I have to choose to be less reactive. But if I continue to uh, try to input new software up again and it runs up against this hardware that's been in there since I was a little kid, my hardware is going to say, we don't run that operating system. Go away. Go away. And we continue, I continue to be reactive. But if I can go in, change the hardware, which is work. It is worthwhile work. Baby symbol for more. Um, then my capacity is going to change. My responses are going to be ones that I can choose to have. And less reactive, more responsive, my friends, that is a lifelong worthy goal to reach for. Daniel Pink's book, When. Um, it's like Sachin Panda's book, but for productivity and, and sales. Um, it's worth it. And he does a great job of extracting all the science and making it kind of into a more accessible uh, mechanism without kind of the, the same overwhelm. So, you know, if you've ever heard of the 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle is a valuable thing. Try to think about the 20% of the, the seed forms of the things for the 80% of the outcomes you're trying to generate. So if there were things that are just keeping you busy making, maybe um, you can strip that away. Um, the binaural sleep pattern. Diurnal rhythms influence the performance of your professional duties. So paying attention to these timings and everything is, is valuable. Um, habituation, short breaks allow yourselves to generate a little bit of refresh. So for example, the um, Pomodoro method uses usually, it's named after a guy who used a tomato timer, I guess. Um, so what he would do is he would set 25 minute periods with five minute breaks and 25 minute periods and five minute breaks. And this allows his brain to stay on task for a consistent 25 minutes and then take a five minute break and allows him to reset, reset, reset. And um, it's valuable. I've been practicing it and honestly, I've been more productive as a byproduct of it. And I've been using that within those periods of peak in the morning, run into the trough in the afternoon between one and five. And then again, that iterative and less analytic, more insightful period in the evening. And just doing that dance every day is giving me a lot more purchase on, oh great, I can start to generate how and where I would like to relate to the tasks. Again, one of the most important things to focus on is don't allow the mundane tasks to enter your peak period. So if you've got like, if you've got one thing that accomplishing it today is going to make a change in your life, if you can get that thing done in that peak period, the rest of your day is gravy, my friends. So um, when you need to take a break, here's a couple of baseline rules. Moving beats stationary. Social beats solo. Let me say that again. Social beats solo. Outside beats inside. And fully detached rather than semi-detached. So many of us, because our phones are our worlds now, it's kind of like the remote control of our day. It's really hard for us to step back from it. But if you can, gosh, like the possibilities there are, are really spacious because rather than just checking the price of crypto or checking Instagram or checking the news or checking your email and responding to something, carve out periods of time, 25 minute periods, set a timer. That's when you pick up your phone and you respond to all the text messages. People don't need to have you respond in real time all the time. If they do believe that, that's on you. You are the one who architects when you reply. You do not have to. Just because you posted something on Instagram today does not mean that you 
are on somebody else's clock and that you have to text them back in the, in the next 30 seconds or the next two minutes. We are entrained to respond, react in this way where we can teach others to have a different response. So play with this, consider this permission. This is just a moment in a day. I want to respect that this has been a half an hour of your time and I am just so grateful that you're here. Uh, Generally Anatomy is just this course that I, I've been shaping and helping to share with people more about their body, how it works so that we can, you and I, be healthier in the relationships that we're having because it's less about me and you and more about the relationships that exist between us. So me and the relationship that I'm choosing to have with myself, well, that dance, I've definitely profited by this work. And I hope that a little bit of curiosity and it goes a long way for you too. So many blessings. I'm going to uh, check some of your responses right now and Just see that you're here. Um. <laughs> All right, hello, uh, Yvonne. Caesar, yes, manifestation is real. Um, meditation is profound. It, you know, we have to remember that um, thinking something makes it real, but, uh, and thinking is an electrical sort of signal out into the world. But to draw back to us, we also need some sort of magnetic component, and that's the heart. So, we have to move from a place of feeling. When you manifest, you have to work from a place of drawing something towards you. You almost have to exist in it as a, as a state ahead of the actual experience of it, which is tricky, but it's worthwhile. Kate, you're gonna enjoy that book. Um, Lisa, I have five different books going. Um, Yeah, Max, you have to, if you've never looked at it, um, gosh, what's it called now? The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. They have a chart that breaks down um, what's important versus what's uh, urgent. And I just found that so helpful because I think there's a lot of things that I'm just trying to push into the world that feel like I've been told that they're urgent and they're not. And in fact, if I focus on that 20%, chances are that's actually what's going to um, change the 80%, right? So, um, binaural sleep patterns. Marjorie, do you mean like using binaural audio in order to generate sleep? Or, um, sorry, when I saw it earlier, I thought you meant biurinal, which is like twice daily sort of thing. Um, Michelle, I haven't checked out the Galloway method, but I will look into it. Um, but I think I know what you mean. I used to use it. Um, if it was what, when I, when I played rugby at eye level, I used to use it at street lamps. So I would like run, you know, interval training type stuff, um, three street lamps and I would give myself a break for one street lamp sort of thing. Um, Kate, check out Pomodoro. I honestly really um, appreciate it. It's, um, and, you know, helping to prioritize, like if I get this one task done, that really transitions my day. Now, all of a sudden, if I spend the rest of the day reading, I don't feel so bad about it because, um, yeah, you know, like I got that task done that really like changed my day. So um sign up for so many courses uh you know i've definitely done that 
Um, Lisa, I've, I do, I do sign up for courses. I, I'm a Sagittarius and I'm a double Sag at that. So I really do. I love information and I love having a knowledge. One thing that I'm existing in right now is that knowledge needs to be applied so that it's useful. And, um, you know, it depends on, on what your, what your world's like, Lisa, but one of the rules that I've been operating from lately is that I can only consume somebody else's content when, and this is mine. So I just want to be clear about that. But when I've, um, created my own, I can't consume somebody else's content until I've created my own. And so that helps me uh, almost have a, a healthier relationship, right? Because, you know, I think it's good to be curious and signing up for, for courses um, is awesome. It, it shows that you're interested in the world around you and, and we need that, right? Like now more than ever, it's, it's a fascinating and um, dichotomous time to be alive. So maybe commit to a fixed period. I know some people have trained me over the years to use um, like negative reinforcement, which I was never really a fan of, but it does work. Like for example, if you start a course and then you don't finish the course, you have to give $20 to a kid in the street or something, you know, some sort of like, negative reinforcement so that you do continue to generate follow through. Um, but you know, also I, I just want to say that like keeping yourself, um, improving is really the target. Like if you just improve 1% every day in a year, that's something like 33% improvement. So like be kind to yourself. And if the thing is no longer of interest, because I mean, it's, I find that with a lot of people, they sign up for a lot of things and then gradually they realize like, oh, I don't care about this. Like if you don't care, then wash your hands of it. It's okay. Marjorie, I do know that. Um, I do it. Um, and I do it from a different place, I think, because I think our ancestors used to do it because of the heat of the day. It was almost, some of it was almost like Spain siesta type stuff, but it was also, um, you know, the way, I mean, we existed before artificial light. And so sometimes what I do, um, and I mean, I think, uh, what I've done and enjoyed doing is that I'll wake up sometimes at like three in the morning, I'll meditate for a couple of hours and I'll go back to bed. And there's a, there's something called the hypnagogic state, which is uh, just as we're coming out of sleep, we're in this very in between place, right? It's the closest we've been to REM sleep. And so those Delta theta brain waves, wave states are um, really accessible for us which is kind of a sweet spot. And so if you've ever been interested in lucid dreaming, one of the things that I will do is I'll set my alarm early and I'll turn it off and I'll go back to bed and, you know, using a second alarm just to kind of wake me up for the real time, that liminal space that I'm in already is just, I can drop because I've come back out to a brainwave state like alpha, all of a sudden I'm, I'm in that place where it's like, oh, I have enough alertness, but I also have access to those deeper rhythms. So now I can get back there, bringing some of that access, uh, that some of that awareness. And so, um, sounds like sounds like an opportunity. Um, wow, this is so fun! Thanks to you guys for engaging. I honestly really. Um, so much of my life. I've been a Sagittarius, which has looked like firing off arrows without really aiming them. And this is me harnessing some of these ideas that I'm sharing with you 
to aim them a little bit more. And at the core of it is to be of service. So I hope and I love that uh, I'm engaging with more of you all the time. That is a privilege and, a, and an honor. And yeah, I look forward to being here. I'm going to be here every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And so I look forward to sharing with you more ideas and more thoughts. Um, a lot of it is going to be focused around generally anatomy, which um, your donations go towards uh, funneling and producing that content. And it's going to be on Insight Timer ideally by the end of the month. So the idea being that without learning all of the terms for the body and all of the, the sort of superficial, let's say Western, very linear anatomy, you're going to learn how the body relates to itself and gravity and um, what comes first, how we can till that soil so that we can plant seeds that we'd like to grow. Lisa, I, I love music. I, um, <laughs> I was asked the other day if I ever thought about joining a band. And it's funny, I, um, one of the things that I've loved studying, but I have also, also plateaued on is music. And I think it's just because I, I have so many interests. Anyway, um, I, Scorpio, yes, my, um, my Neptune is in Scorpio, I think right now. Um, I'm a double Sag with a moon in Virgo. Uh, how long do you need to sleep to get full REM? in at least one of those shifts. Full REM is tricky just because um, what happens is you drop down and then you kind of come back up and you drop down and you come back up and you drop down and you kind of go through that a couple of times. Uh, think of REM sleep as like the kick drum in the band, right? So that foot pedal, boom, boom, boom. We have to get down there. Um, and so, you know, when we start, we're kind of like the hi hat and the, and the snare, um, every now and then a tom tom. And so, as you drop down, uh, it takes a while, it takes a couple hours. And so, I believe that four hours will get you to the first REM cycle, uh, and then you have to kind of hang out there for a bit. Um, so I would say the first, and I could be wrong about this, but I believe like the four to five, six hour cycle is probably going to give you like a good couple of experiences. Alternatively, I would recommend yoga nidra. I, I cannot recommend it enough. A lot of people use it just at nighttime, but again, because that hypnagogic state, because of that liminal place, if the first thing you do when you wake up is put on headphones and go into a recorded yoga nidra, yoga nidra, then you're going to already be having a lot of that REM cycle that you can piggyback and amplify. So I would actually recommend that, Marjorie. I think um, because you're going to get into theta brainwave states, which is what a lot of the REM cycle is. So worth it, um, I personally think. So, um, yeah, 100%. Shooting arrows without aiming them. Uh, I think that's one of the joys about being a Sagittarius is we are kind of the philosophers of the, the Zodiac. And we're also the only mythical creature of the Zodiac. So we are like a little bit, you know, um, I mean, I look at my bookshelf and I, I mean, I've got it all in there. I have books on language. I've got books on uh, symbolism. I've got books on the Silk Road and the art of the occult, uh, James Beard cookbook, how to build a brain. Um, a lot of anatomy and physiology and all that stuff, but, um, 
you know, yoga. <laughs> I'm going to let you have your day. I will see you Thursday, I believe, at 5.30 Pacific Standard Time to uh, walk you through the anatomy of meditation, which is going to help us sit for longer in stillness, which is um, part of why I love the study of anatomy so much. So I think um, thanks are in order. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, that is PM, 5.30 PM Pacific Standard Time. So that's 8.30 Eastern. And we're gonna go through for probably about a half an hour uh, to 40 minutes of anatomy. And I'm gonna give you some really practical, simple ways of putting yourself deeper into your body and then We'll stick, stick around for a bit and we will meditate together. Um, you know, I've, I've been, I don't know, I started this when I was five. My grandmother was a Hindu priestess and she taught me, she gave me permission really to get going on this life. And it feels like in many ways here in my middle, mid forties that this is, um, It's really only getting going. So <laughs> um, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for, for donating. And thank you so much for being you. Honestly, the fact that you're on this resource and sharing with the community around you is just such a treat. And um, yeah, I'm excited to continue to build this with you all. So we're going to, at times, talk about uh, Anatomy, we're going to talk about different ways to access the body. We're going to talk about how you can have a better relationship with your life. And because um, why not, really? Life is so short. And the fact that we have this wonderful opportunity through technology and, and this time in the world. The time is now, my friends. Many blessings go forth and share your brightness with the world. Um, yeah, honestly, you know, we all started, Susan, at different places and we all started and move at different paces and how wonderful that we're all here together doing this now. It's all we have is right now. So many blessings. I am going to um, say sayonara.